Let's do it. Yeah, great. Thank great. you so much for everyone taking the time to join. Um, I am Crystal Hu. I cover venture and the startups for Reuters. And as many of you guys know, AI and the wave of ChatGPT has burst into the scene for a lot of people in the past few months. Um, and the one big part of my job is to figure out the technology and how it's changing different aspects of life. Um, so today's topic will be focusing on how ChatGPT will shape the future of customer service. Um, we will discuss topics like what exactly is ChatGPT and the large language models um, and how this technology will be used, the impact it will have on existing and the future technologies, um, and also how our startups are incorporating this technology and how new companies are being, being built. Um, so we have a great, pa great panel today. Um, two amazing investors from Bessemer, Talia Goldberg and Ethan Kurzweil. Uh, Talia is based in San Francisco and she invests across consumer internet and software businesses, works with companies from Service Titan and Discord. Uh, Ethan Kurzweil is also based in San Francisco and she uh, he leads in a, investors in a variety of verticals, including developer platforms, new data infra, as well as uh, digital consumer applications and the crypto. He also works uh, pretty closely with Intercom. Uh, and then we are to have the direct of machine learning at Intercom, Fergal Reed with us today, uh, giving us an inside look about how Intercom incorporating this technology in its latest offerings, uh, including a few AI assistant features. So I look forward to here, pick your pick their brains and hear what they're seeing on both the startup and the venture front and the changes that GPT will bring. Um, and as you see, we have a pretty straightforward Q&A model on our right side. So throughout the process, if you have any questions, feel free to pop your question in the chat and we will have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the conversation to go through the questions. So I'll dig in. Um, so I guess I'll start with you Virgo, because you are seems that you are the technologist in the room, and you are also on the front line of incorporating GPT into Intercom's offerings, and a few features have went live a few weeks ago. Um, so maybe you can start by giving us a bit background of what explain like we are five year old. What is uh, GPT and ChatGPT, and how how did it come about for you guys to incorporate this technology? Yeah, um, it, 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 exciting. It's, it's a very exciting time in technology. Um, and I, I'm going to presume a lot of people have probably seen uh, ChatGPT at this point because it, it just made it such a big wave. Um, but I, I guess from the technology perspective, um, from, from my narrow view of the world, um, I've been in Intercom about five years and run a machine learning team here. And, you know, the, the sort of machine learning things we've done, you know, using algorithms that have been around a while, using like supervised learning algorithms algorithms that kind of like you know they learn to kind of like tell apart things you can sort of be like hey you know here is um let, let's predict whether someone's uh going to ask uh for one thing or let's predict whether they're going to ask for another um and you know the, 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 that's kind of like machine learning systems where you just you give them a lot of training data you sort of give them examples of like hey this is like this is an example of someone asking one question. This is an example of someone asking another question. And what's sort of new and what's different here um, with this latest wave of AI, generative AI, is kind of like, instead of just teaching a model to sort of predict one thing or another, you're sort of saying, hey model, learn how to generate new data of this type. Learn how to generate an image and um, learn how like, give it some text and learn to generate an image that you know maps to that text. Or with ChatGPT, just kind of like talk to it and give it some text. And, you know, it, it sort of gets pretty good at generating more text in response to that. And it's just a different way of doing machine learning. It's a way of doing machine learning by saying, hey, I'm not going to like code, you know, rules or I'm not going to code. I'm not going to like specifically say, learn to predict X versus Y. I'm going to instead take a really large amount of training data and I'm going to make a model that's like, just very good at trying to predict that training data. And then hopefully I can get it to do useful things by like generating new examples. And so 
you know, chat GPT, it's kind of like, you know, you, you, you ask it something by giving it some text and saying, generate what comes next. And surprisingly, it turns out that's pretty useful. You can sort of say, hey, here's a customer support conversation. And this is the summary of the support conversation, colon. And then kind of like give it to chat GPT and it'll sort of generate what happens next or what, what, what it would expect to see next. And perhaps surprisingly, you know, you, you say, this is the summary and then a summary pops out. And that's very useful. That's, it's a very general way of building building features and systems instead of like, hey, we're going to code a, a new machine learning system for every little thing. Instead, we've got this really big model that we can just kind of ask it questions in English, like give tell it to do things in English, and just uh, it, it's it's surprisingly pretty good at just doing doing what we kind of what we tell it to, uh, just in English. And yeah, and so at Intercom, we've been trying to um, to use that to build product features. And yeah. Yeah, that's super helpful overview. And we're already having questions about how you guys exactly did it with your uh, new features and stuff. So we'll come back to that. I do want to bring Talia and Ethan to stage as a prolific investors in the space. You guys have seen a couple of technological waves. Uh, how this how this one about generative AI is different and what are the areas of applications you're excited about? Maybe we'll start with Talia. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, that was a great overview of, you know, really what generative AI is. And it's funny, I was looking just before this meeting at a piece that we published on our blog, maybe last summer. So something like eight months ago or nine months ago. And this was right before chat GPT, you know, a few months before chat GPT even launched, but we were starting to see a lot of, um, momentum and in, uh, reason to be excited about what was happening with large language models in particular and the potential of AI and generative AI um, as this kind of new wave and really powerful wave of artificial intelligence. And we had a prediction that said I, um, in the piece, and I'm looking at it right now, that said, today, less than 1% of online content is generated using AI. And within the next 10 years, we predict that at least 50% of all will be generated by or augmented by AI. And we kind of were debating that and we thought that it was like a wild thing to say, but we had some assumptions and calculations. But I feel pretty good. The next 10 years, I look at that and I'm like, holy shit, we underestimated how fast and how quickly AI can really transform a lot of information that we see. And I'd say, you know, it could be 50% within the next two years um, of a lot of our online interactions, content, and media. And so the implications of that, I think, are, are vast, including customer support, but broadly across a lot of information and knowledge work. And Ethan, I know you have been working with Intercom for a while. Is this kind of the moment you think like the company is the customer service has been waiting for? Because I feel like the, the technology and opportunity is golden for a customer service applications like Intercom. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is maybe the bleeding edge application of large language models and what they can do. We're kind of seeing it here. Um, I think if you kind of step way back and you think about technology changes, platform shifts like the you know, smartphone moment, the iPhone moment and things like that. Um, what happens early on is that there's all this excitement and lots of developers and lots of creators kind of rush into a space. Um, and then you sort of have this washout of where you kind of see which are the bleeding edge applications where it sticks first. And then the, the ones where it doesn't get, gets you into sort of a little bit of a trough of disillusionment moment. Um, but through that period, which is, I think we're, we're probably a little early on that curve still, but you see the sticky use cases right away where the, where the technology is sort of ripe for, um, I don't want to use a cliche term, but really ripe for disrupting, improving, augmenting, making better. Um, and customer support is kind of right down the fairway for that. And, you know, Intercom, I mean, yeah, sort of about, I worked with Intercom now for, um, for almost eight and a half years. Um, and, you know, Intercom's been a team that's always been kind of at the forefront of adopting new technologies when they're ready. And I remember like, you know, two or three years ago, people said automation, 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 let's, let's just make. And the, the leadership at Intercom, the product leadership always said, it's not good enough yet. You know, we can do it. We can stick it in, in such a way that, um, 
you know, we could check a box on some uh, on a sort of feature request form, but it won't lead to a really good kind of human like flow. And Intercom's always been founded around this, you know, idea of making, um, you know, internet business personal. And so if you have a, a bot that doesn't sound personal, that's orthogonal to that. And so I, uh, the fact the fact that Intercom's using it so successfully in their flow, I think, shows you the technology is ready, as Fergal was alluding to, um, and that you know this is one of many many things that we're going to see this impact. Uh, not everything all at once right away, but over time we'll see many more impacts by um, you know by giving a machine the ability to converse in a human like way. If I can just add one thing, like I think customer support is. Um just such the perfect, perfect initial area for AI, you know, to really start to impact. And one of the reasons of that is that it's, you know, it uses natural language. You can communicate with the AI using English and it will respond in English. You don't need to code. It generates information. And that's, you know, what customer service and support is like. It's generating really great human-like experiences that can be personalized, resolving complaints and getting better and better over time. So you also get this great feedback loop in um, using customer support. So it's one of the areas that we think is going to advance the fastest as well. Um, and even though there may be some challenges and things that are rough around the edges today, the technology and the potential already really great, as Ethan said, and you look at the curve and the rate of improvement, and it's going to be even so much better a few months from now, a few quarters from now, and then a few years from now. And so it's really like this perfect, perfect use case um, for all these reasons for AI and one of the categories that we're most excited about and we think every business, you know, can take advantage of and needs to be thinking about. And I think, Fergo, this is the right timing for you to give us an overview of the recent launch of features and how you guys incorporated uh, ChatGPT into it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And uh, just, just, just to, to, to echo, I guess, Talia and Ethan's sentiment here that, you know, there's so much structure in the domain, right? There's just there's so much you know, things that the customer support agent does that, hey, they're doing the same thing again that they've maybe done the last day or that maybe uh, one of your teammates has done before. And there's so much regularity and so much structure that it just, it feels really ripe for a system that sort of like, you know, learns and uses AI to kind of, to, to, to make people faster there. And so we really, um, like a lot of people, uh, when, you know, ChatGPT launched, um, at the same time, OpenAI released this new model for developers to use, uh, which they called Text Da Vinci Tree. And um, we kind of, you know, we, we've, we've, we've had a relationship with OpenAI for a long time. And we really felt when we looked at that model, we were like, wow, this is really crossing a threshold of usefulness. We can, we can build with this. And so we did some initial benchmarking. We were like, hey, you know, people in the inbox, they spend a lot of time in the inbox. And one thing they have to do a lot is they have to write summaries of the conversation that they just looked at before they hand it over. This technology seems to be really great at doing conversational summarization. And so we were like, can we build a feature that does this? And can we get it out and get it to our beta customers? And you know, Intercom is this, uh, I guess, principle around like ship to learn. We believe in shipping new features extremely fast to customers so that we can learn whether it's really solved a problem or whether it's more of a curiosity. And so um, basically, you know, in early December, um, we started a, a project to see if we could really quickly ship some features that would work with a customer support rep so that it would work in the actual inbox to kind of make them faster. So one was summarization. We had other features around helping them compose text faster. And, you know, we really felt that uh, that was the right place to start with this technology because generative AI, it, it does have a downside. And the downside is that it's not always uh, accurate as much as you might think. So it's very easy as a human to look at ChatGPT and, you know, you ask it a question, it gives you a response. You think, this is amazing. This is perfect. And then you kind of you read a little bit more detail you're like oh well actually sometimes it, it gets things wrong and so we felt that really the the kind of the best place to get started here was with sort of a, a human in the loop style experience so it's like you know someone's rep they're in the inbox we want to make them faster they're, they're still able to kind of check and approve it you know so example I, I mentioned you know we built a feature to help people summarize conversations you get to read over that summary and it makes you faster but you get to check and if there's any error there, you can sort of like correct it. 
And um, so we really feel that like that was a really great starting point for you know AI for customer support. Um, now I see people asking in the comments, just kind of saying like things like, "Hey, what about um, you know bots and you know things that uh, that kind of can answer questions themselves?" We do think that's coming, and that may be coming soon. Um, but we're still sort of we're still exploring that. And the big issue for us is really accuracy. You know, we, we feel it's it's really ripe right now to have a human in the loop, um, where you know it, it makes a human faster, it makes a support rep faster. We think probably coming soon is um, you know things to kind of that kind of go to that next step. Um, I think that's a very interesting area at the moment. Just, but, just uh, that. Yeah, yeah, just to riff on that, and we're getting some some interesting sort of forward-looking questions. Like I, I just wanted to call out Greg's question um, around: Will will this make my days numbered as a copywriter? I don't think so at all. I mean, I think as Fergal was alluding to, where this technology is and it's likely to stay for a while is in augmenting human capabilities and human intelligence, making you more productive as a copywriter, but not necessarily replacing you. Because first of all, the technology is not there yet. And second of all, the bar for what really amazing customer support or any communication with a, with a, with a business or a technology is just going to go up and up as we have these resources. And so while the technology may be able to handle um, uh, you know, some copywriter use cases, some support uh, response use cases on its own, the bar for what's going to be really good uh, copy and what's going to be a really good support experience and on and on through you know other functional areas also it's just going to rise as we have access to these technologies and so you know hopefully the ideal state is that you know to to greg out there you're going to have access to these technologies so you're going to be able to be more productive but it's not going to replace you anytime soon yeah just to echo that like i love how wyatt just said it's a ability multiplier you know we we talk a lot about internally the example of copilot which is kind of like autocomplete for coding and it is making engineers already like significantly more efficient um which has many benefits it doesn't at all replace engineers or engineering and coding um, but it can augment it and so you know a very very basic example of that might be you know the the calculator even like in back in the day we used to do math by hand and and now we use calculators but math is still very important we all need to learn it we do it um and mathematicians are are very um important in this world um and i think arguably your role may become even more important because as the cost and uh, to create content goes down and there's a flood of a lot of different content and information creating content and information that can actually stand out and rise above is going to be at an even greater premium um, over the next few years. It's been a few weeks since uh, Intercom launched is like AI assistive features. Um, so what's the early feedback that you have seen? And someone also asked, what's do you, how do you measure kind of the success of incorporating this technology? Yeah, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll be very transparent about that. I, I have, um, I have, uh, you know, I don't have a fully satisfying answer to that question yet. And um, uh, what I can tell you is that, um, you know, we're now live. We we have thousands of customers who are using this now and using it regularly. And so, you know, we, we've had a lot of adoption. And um, we likely will try and measure. Hey, has this actually made people? more productive because you know let's say for our own cs team we can gather telemetry on you know to, are you faster if you use these features and you know probably put together some form of controlled experiment for that and we always like to try and get you know some form of actual data on this at some point we're not at that point yet and um, we probably likely will have some numbers on that at least internally or more of an understanding of it internally in you know a month or two i would guess um but uh what I can tell you at the moment is we're seeing a lot of adoption, we're seeing a lot of excitement, and we're seeing a lot of usage. Um, customers, there's definitely some features like summarization that customers tell us uh, saves them substantial time. They're like some, you know, we, we have we have had customers tell us things like, "Hey, for some customer convers some conversations, it can take as long to write the summary for a handover as it can to actually resolve the the, the end user's issue," and so. You know, we definitely feel good about that. And um, some of our other features we have, where it sort of it writes, uh, you know, you write a shorthand, a little bit like GitHub Copilot. We were inspired by Copilot. In Copilot, if you're a programmer, you can sort of write a 
comment or you can write shorthand and then it will fill out the code. One of our features that we shipped is expand where you write a shorthand and then it kind of, it turns it into a, a longer support message. Sometimes that works and saves people time. We don't have data on that yet. And um, we also, what we have live at the moment is really just a generation one version of that. And so we have, uh, we have prototypes of a generation two version where instead of it just like at the moment, um, you know, you just write the shorthand and then the, the large language model sort of expands that out. What we're trying to do instead is we're trying to say, hey, let's pull in the last time you answered a question like that. Let's pull in macros that are relevant to this. And we have some internal prototypes there that are, are working pretty well. Um, and so we sort of, we think that we're, we're still innovating and we're still doing things that make it, uh, that, that are going to really move the needle uh, for that sort of uh, co-pilot style, expansion style uh, user interface as well. Um, but we don't have, we don't have metrics yet, although we will soon probably. And to follow up on that, how do you measure the cost of it? Uh, as, I, uh, as I understand, um, you probably send like inquiries uh, to OpenAI and for them to ch charge like certain, I guess, two cents per 1,000 characters, something like yeah. that. Um, and I guess as your adoptions rises, that bill also pile, pile up. So do you have any learnings or observations to share for other staff is maybe also thinking about incorporating this technology? Yeah, I, I have a I have a chart and tableau of our, our daily spend with, with OpenAI that uh, we, we we kind of we we keep a, a nervous a nervous watch on, um, you know, look, it, it's definitely a consideration. So I, I mentioned the summarization feature, and we've built it in a very human in the loop way, where it's like you've got to ask for the summary before you hand over the question. And one thing a lot of you know our customers say to us is like, hey, Intercom, why do I have to ask for this summary? please just maintain a summary at all times in the sidebar. And so I never have to ask for it. And like that would get really expensive because if we had to pay kind of like two cents, you know, for every time if someone said something new in the conversation and the summary changed, that that would start to get extremely expensive. So we absolutely have to take cost into consideration here in a way that we don't with more traditional machine learning models. That said, um, OpenAI just announced their ChatGPT API, and um, it was, I think, I think it surprised a lot of people because it was 10 times cheaper than, you know, the previous similar models in that series. And so, you know, it, it's, it, it's possible that the cost drops pretty fast here and that these features just become widely adopted. So I, I think, Crystal, you started, you said, like, what about other startups or other companies building in this area? The advice I think that we would give at Intercom is like, hey, try and get in market fast here because there's real value here for your customers that you can build and that you can unlock. And like probably the cost will come down either because the models will get cheaper as vendors like OpenAI figure out how to, to make them more efficient or because you'll figure out more efficient ways to use them. You'll figure out ways of saying, hey, I can use a cheaper generative model for like the first part of a conversation. And then when I have this much harder task that requires more accuracy, I'll use the more expensive one. Um, I, I'd love to hear if, if there's a, I, I think Ethan and Tally probably have a much broader view of that than, than I do from one company. I, I'd love to hear their thoughts. Well, I mean, I think it's a good example of what you sometimes see with these bleeding edge technologies is what is in the beginning, you the high value use cases get them. Um, and I, I think what, what you're, um, you're describing the actualization of that principle that at Intercom, that's the sort of, that's the summary feature today and other things, the summary feature when requested today and it may, but over time, the technology will be much more ubiquitous and much cheaper. And so that's when it gets more, more, um, it can proliferate into more use cases where the marginal cost of doing it is just prohibitive today. And what that allows for is developers to discover other applications of large language models in this type of AI that we're not really predicting. I mean, Talia and I at Bessemer, we try to um, come up with roadmaps where we think technology will go. But as a developer oriented investor, one of the key primitives that I always think to is you're never really sure what developers are going to do with a new technology change, a new platform, a new access to something until they sort of have it and have it in a ubiquitous, you know, where they're not paying two cents every time they make an API call where it's, you know, they can really riff and 
do some things that kind of sound absurd at first. Um, and so that's, I'm excited about the, 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 the technology getting to the, to the point where there's just a ton of experimentation and I'm, I'm sure intercom will in the product road in the, not in the product roadmap today, but in the product a year from now, there'll be some things that we just didn't predict, but have really high value for customers. And there'll be some startups that just came out uh, because they riffed on some particular way you can use, um, you know, generative text or, or, uh, and, and it, it just, it created a really great user experience for somebody. Talia, do you want to add to that? I think that was a, that was a great summary. I, um, you know, there's a, a, a fun example that I think can emphasize some of the human like, you know, potential to augment experiences that we've recently seen and been talking about um, internally at Bessemer relevant to support, which is um, if I'm talking to, let's say, you know, some some of the intercom team with that, which has, you know, strong Irish accents, and, and they probably think I have like a crazy Western accent. And so it's, you know, hard for us to at times understand each other when we're super excited and talking really fast. And it sounds like it's a different language, even though it turns out <laughs> everyone's speaking English. Well, you know, there's AI that can, um, you know, in real time, um, kind of change the accents um of a, of a person a bit to make it a bit more understandable on both ways so if i have a irish accent or a british accent you know it will you in real time translate that into a, a, a california you know west coast english um accent and uh, that can really improve the experience in some ways by lowering the barriers to communication and understanding so i think you know thinking through how you can even improve this human-like personalized experience can be really powerful it's a good example because it's like technology getting in the middle of a of a direct communication, but making it more human like, which is kind of a little bit uh, sounds like an oxymoron. But actually, if if deployed, well, I haven't actually tried it yet. But if deployed, well, could actually make the experience make you feel more connected with, um, you know, in a messaging context or, or in a communication context, which is the promise of the Internet, right, bringing us all together and breaking down barriers. And so I, I really am a big believer in the potential to supercharge that. Yeah. And in terms of adopting this, uh, I think a lot of people having the questions of how do we make sure everything we get will be correct, like in terms of the information flow that will, it will be accurate or no harm. Uh, I think the stake is different, right, in, in different use cases. But in general, you don't want to provide a wrong information to your like customers. So how do we ensure that in your kind of daily applications and development? Maybe one just comment, and then I think I'll let Fergal kind of answer more specifically on, on Intercom, which is how I think about these models being trained. Um, and an example that I really like is that the models are trained on enormous, enormous amounts of data. So you know, many, many billions and billions of points of data and information. Um, and so no matter how much, you know, you might try and, you know, trick the, the data or put in false data, it's still such a tiny, tiny portion of the overall data that it's like a little minnow in a sea. Um, and so that's just one, one thing to keep in mind as you think about how these models are created. And the other thing is the data inputs. I know there's concern about, oh gosh, well, what if it's trained on data that's, you know, incorrect or wrong. And, and don't get me wrong, there are certainly challenges. There's issues with, you know, hallucination and other areas. So there's a lot to improve. But how I think about the data training is that, like in your life, it's not that you go around and you don't see things that might be wrong or biased or um, misinformation. You, you you do come across that, but you you use your judgment and your and your mind. And there's a lot of good other data. And so it's not that you as a human can never see those things because that would be impossible walking around the world. It's that you're able to filter appropriately. And so that's how I think about the, the large language models too, is that there will be some instances in which there's data and information that isn't what you'd want in that training set. But the language model's ability to filter that and to get to the right answer is improving and should be better and better over time. There's some interesting questions in here, both on data privacy and then you know, the data accuracy question that, that Talia just addressed. Um, the other thing to keep in mind on the data accuracy question before maybe we get to the privacy part is you can actually set uh, in some, you know, in the future and in, in some language, large language models, an accuracy quotient, kind of like if folks remember um, 
when uh, an AI was programmed to win Jeopardy, it had a confidence interval that it sort of knew the answer to a question was this with a 90% confidence, 60% comp confidence. And in that context, like wrong answer, you just lose some points. They set the interval pretty low, you know, at 40 or something. If you're 40% sure or more, what the hell, go, go, go try it, answer the question. There may be some context where you want human level accuracy and you set it there. And then a lot of times the AI just doesn't, can't get to that can't get to that level, can't get to the 99th percentile, and it'll 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 return a null set or kick over to a human or something like that. There may be some context, even in the military, even in highly regulated industries, where you have more tolerance for a guess, for, a, for an educated, um, uh, you know, AI-assisted guess. And so that could be one of the parameters that's set long term as to how much confidence AI do you have in this response? If it's just not good enough, don't give it. Just to come in on that, Ethan, yeah, that's definitely a strong product belief that we have internally in Intercom, which is that um, it, it's quite likely that there will be, you know, a, a variety of tolerances out here. There will be some customers of ours where they have quite a high tolerance for, give me the suggestion. It's okay if the suggestion's wrong occasionally. And then there'll be other people where, other customers where there's very, very low tolerance for that. And we expect we'll need to have some degree of configuration around this. And, you know, um, just, just to give it, to really dive into the weeds with, with some of the things we're, we're kind of looking at in the future here is, an example is, let's say that you have something that tries to consume a, an article or consume some content and respond, answer a question with that content. You know, one example is you can constrain it to say, hey, you've got to provide an exact quote. You're only allowed to respond with like an exact quote from this. And, you know, it can put that quote in context, but that quote's got to be there. That, that's kind of, that, that's a conservative way of using these new, these new large language models to kind of like do a better job at like understanding your query and retrieving the information, but constraining what they can actually say. Um, and, you know, another example is you can take a generative model and to allow it underneath the hood to be generative but to only interact with an end user through a predefined series of actions or things it can say. And so th there are a lot of techniques to kind of take the powerful engine that understands things and to try and make it safer or make it more trustworthy or make it more constrained. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, people like Intercom, a lot of other companies that kind of work with that techniques. It's like we've got our hands on this, this new underlying technology that can make much better predictions and can do things much faster and better. Okay, how do we take that and do the hard work of of making it trustworthy enough, or if if we you know or at least give, allowing customers to kind of to choose there? I think you're going to see a lot of movement in this space over the next little while. Yes. And on that note, Ethan Talia, besides customer service, any other applications you're seeing uh, in this uh, space that you're particularly excited about? I mean, I can go first. I look at some of the consumer applications. So gaming is one that, that we're excited about. If you think about um, uh, what makes games fun, a lot of times it's kind of the refresh rate on new content. And so, and that requires, you know, constantly coming up with creative ideas. Um, we're starting to see people thinking about, well, what if every experience for every player can be new, which you, you couldn't have a personal copywriter writing that much content for each person but an AI could do it um, and it could get down to the level of, you know, each decision you make in a game generates a new, a new experience, you know, new copy, but also a new experience based on whatever temporal inputs you want to give the system at that point. Um, so that's one that I think is cool. I think, you know, consumer applications broadly, you know, media applications as well. Um, you know, I think about, um, I used to work earlier in my career at the Wall Street Journal and the parent company of the Wall Street Journal was Dow Jones and they had a sister news department called now Dow Jones Newswires, which was about, um, you know, getting uh, financial news to mainly traders and folks that needed to act very quickly on that information um, to people as fast as possible through terminals and things like that. Um, but I think about what an AI could do to augment news or get news to, to um, um, you know, to the end user quicker. Again, I don't think, you know, don't worry, Crystal, I don't think it's like replacing journalists at all. I think it's sort of augmenting the amount of information and the targeting of information that we can provide to folks much more quickly. I think about entertainment use cases also, um, where, you know, this, this promise of sort of more personalized television, more personalized 
premium content service has always been out there, but when you get to the sort of long tail of internet content, the UGC stuff, it tends to be pretty, pretty low quality. Could you have kind of a, you know, high quality, but personalized kind of content delivery service? I think AI could impact that, uh, that equation in the future. Those are just some of the things. Ty has probably been thinking about this question longer than I have. I love that, I, the, the concept of like the personalization and everyone having their own experience. You know, we went from like handcrafted goods to mass produced goods to now it's like mass personalization in a way that, you know, we've probably never seen before. It's not just like your logo here. This is like a totally new experience for everyone, which is super cool. Um, maybe I'll, I'll share one of the areas that I actually am not spending time in. I, I wish I had the skill set too, but I think is going to be wildly impactful and is really, really promising, which is in life sciences and in biotech, you know, um, applying AI towards drug discovery and development using huge amounts of data to look at molecules and protein structures and genomic data um, can be really, really transformative. One example of that, just to show the promise, is that I, re I read this study that I think was in Nature uh, a month ago or so, and it described how some researchers gave an AI uh, a bunch of images of a human retina just in the eye. And the AI came back and with like 90% accuracy said which retina belonged to either a male or a female. And that seems very basic, like who cares? Like no one really cares about that. But what's really crazy about that is that no researcher, no scientist, no AI um, expert has ever been able to find any sign of like a retina correlating to gender of any of any form and what that tells you is like the ai is seeing something that we as humans have never before been able to see and so you think about that and then you apply that to like cancer and different cells and otherwise and the potential is just massive and really really exciting and we're already seeing a lot of applications so um ai is going to transform a whole bunch of things health software business applications, logistics, consumer, we could kind of make a long list, but um, there's a ton of reason to be super optimistic for, for our futures. Yeah, it's great to get your perspectives on the front line of talking to the most innovative uh, technology companies. Um, when I talk to startups, when they incorporating this kind of technology into their offerings, one kind of choice they have to make is, you know, which model that they work with, do, do they only work with one type of model or do they diversify their vendors, you know, to work with other companies besides OpenAI? And as OpenAI, you know, pushing new models, how fast they should move along their offerings as well. I'm sure for Virgo, you have spent some time thinking about that. Uh, what was the experience like at Intercom? So, um, you know, with, with new technology being right on the forefront, um, uh, where our head tends to go first at Intercom is to customer value. And so we're like, we're happy to use the, you know, the most expensive or most new model to try and figure out, okay, can we really build a transformative experience for a customer with this that, you know, is a core part of the workflow and, um, and really, really make something valuable for them. And then, you know, once we do that, then we're like, okay, now how can we make it like cost effective? And probably, probably we're going to end up with a, with a large mix of different models and um, say from open AI, we, we've also looked at other vendors like Anthropic um, are doing some really interesting work in this space too. Um, and so, um, yeah, it just, it, it's, it's an exploding space um, the many different people, I think training large language models. And I think you'll have different large language models that are better and worse at, uh, uh, you know, that have different trade-offs in terms of cost and latency and performance and performance won't be a one size fits all. You know, some models that are better at dealing with hallucinations, you some models that are better at like, uh, you know, generation creative content. Uh, I, I think we're already seeing that. And so, um, so yeah, our, our, our kind of, our focus initially is just like, Hey, get whatever models we can and um, try them out check are they you know do we believe we can use these to build transformative value get it live get it live with our customers and then figure out okay let's optimize that afterwards once we know it's it's, it's really delivering value let's optimize in terms of price and cost and um yeah and uh and kind of work on that and highly likely we're going to end up and i think everyone's going to end up running like a a kind of a bespoke mix of many different models for you know literally there could be one customer interaction and you could have like three different models, you know, in there. 
so yeah I, I think it's 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 gonna get complex pretty fast I, I think Virgo had some an interesting point that actually ties the question from before which was how do you measure the success of this because I think lots of companies will try a model or many and then the question will be all right well which is best um and that's such an oversimplification because you sort of have to figure out well what, what what are you trying to achieve are you trying to achieve engagement with your users are you trying to achieve like lack of engagement like quick resolution and so i think there'll be probably a sort of met metricization of this you know kind of a, a, a measurement period where people come to sort of a uh, a standard around the way sort of you know google search created a new industry you know adwords and the way people measured you know click-through rates and conversion rates and effective cpm and things like that i think there'll probably be a new set of metrics that everyone kind of coalesces around that that you measure the effectiveness of your ai your particular business problem on yeah yes. and, and you and sorry just to say you know we, we before even before these more recent large language models like you know, we've had um, we've had bots that you know process natural language using pretty big neural networks, although not as big, for a while. And w whenever we would do something like upgrade our bots, we, we would uh, we, we would conduct like a large scale A/B test, frames in terms of like end user metrics, so like you know the, the self serve rate and so on. And then we would do things like find edge cases for particular customers or particular domains where it performed less well at. And like really dig into those edge cases and make sure there was nothing broken here. So I, I think there, there's there's probably a there's probably a well understood playbook here, like, like Ethan's kind of referring to, for metrics for given domains at the moment. And you know a, a lot of the same things will apply to this new type of technology as well. And so, so yeah. Yeah, I'd love to get to an Q and A because it seems like we have a very thoughtful audience here. I think we're able to address some of the questions during uh, our discussions, but there are a bunch about the potential roadmaps uh, from, I assume, Intercom customers or companies that are already working with Intercom want to know what could be the next next the AI, you know, aided uh, feature that may come out like in the short, both in the short term and long term, and also how that will affect the pricing strategy. Cool. So, um, are there particular questions here, Crystal? Do you want do you want to call out one particular question? Yeah, I think there were a question about your roadmap uh, for the features for the next six months versus twelve to eighteen months, and how Got that it. will. And then the other person asked the pricing strategy. Got it. Um, so I, I guess the first question is, um, we, we definitely have some things coming up that I'm we're not ready to share, and I unfortunately can't talk about it at the moment. And um, I, I would say that. Six months is a really long time in this space. I, I expect you'll see a lot of movement in this space over the next sort of two or three months. Um, we will continue to you know, sweat and invest on these features in our inbox to kind of make support reps more efficient. And I, I already started talked about um, how we had, you know, we've got a generation one version of features here at the moment where it's like, you know, summarization, expand features to kind of help edit text. We're definitely working on generation two versions of those features. Um, we also have two other exciting features in this space that we're really excited about at the moment, but that I unfortunately can't share details with at the moment. It's just a little bit too early to, to kind of to announce and launch those things. So um, I, I guess I can promise you're going to see a lot of action and a lot of excitement from us, and I, I'm sure from other companies in this space as well, um, over the next six months. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a good tease. Uh, but for Talia and Ethan, do you guys have any expectations or hopes or how how fast the space could move? Well, I I think you know broadly how fast the space is moving is it's moving a lot faster than we even anticipated. I know I opened up the conversation sharing that anecdote about our prediction that we made you know eight nine months ago, which seemed totally crazy, and we've already blown. Um, and so the space is moving really quickly, in part because. Um, there's a whole bunch of techno technological advance happening at the same time, you know, as as the hardware um, gets better that these models are trained on and improves at like a Moore's law rate. And there's different new architectures and ways of kind of scaling on that hardware um, and, and more and more information. We're just getting better and better um, at the same time at, at creating new experiences and models. So 
I don't have like an exact prediction of how quickly we'll see different things, but I'll say that one of the biggest areas that we're watching closely and we expect to see a lot of advances in over the next six to 12 months is around um, personalization and being able to kind of create even far more personalized experiences than we're able to right now. Right now, there's a little bit of a context limit for each um, interaction with an AI and a large language model, but there's a lot of exciting research going on that's kind of pushing the boundaries of those context windows and coming up with new frameworks to create far more personalized experiences and kind of remember each person, each user, each customer, and tons of data points about that person uh, to create a better experience. Here's my prediction for what happens. I, I mean, I completely agree with Fergal and Tully. We're going to see predictable and unpredictable applications of this over the next you know, six months, as Fergal said, is a really long time. What I predict happens is there'll be some unsuccessful ones too. And then the narrative will quickly shift to, oh, that didn't do everything we thought it was going to do as we thought. Because uh, right now we're in sort of the peak of momentum and um, euphoria and, dare I say, a little bit of hype in the space. Um, you know, overhype in the space. And so there's going to be a sort of natural correction to that, in which case the narrative will shift quickly to, um, to oh, well, that, that wasn't as big a deal as we thought. And then over time, it'll become as big a deal as we thought. <laughs> and so I just would encourage everyone that's building new products to kind of ride the ups and the downs a little bit. Don't ride the up as high as uh, it may be feeling like you should ride it right now. But also when the narrative changes a little bit, because it will, it's all new technologies, have that sort of, you know, oh, that 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 wasn't as impactful as quickly as we thought moment. Um, I would encourage everyone to keep building through that as well. Yeah, Ethan, I'll definitely take that from you as a crypto investor. So you have <laughs> right. seen it. It's the same um, thing, you know, right now is clearly the trough, a trough of disillusion, maybe like the third or the fourth for crypto as well. And you know, good builders are, are figuring out, okay, what of this technology is applicable? What makes sense? What's good? And we'll see those those things come to market over the next couple of years as well. Yeah. And one common questions I saw uh, in the Q&A is how this will impact human jobs, like human agent jobs, like or one line agent. Uh, I think we alluded to this earlier in general, our AI will be assist a lot of the jobs and improve the productivity. Um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts in this specific case. Um, do, do we expect us to maybe it will take us longer to get into like maybe a human customer service in the future. How does that cooperation between human versus AI assisted customer service look like? I mean, I think ever since the advent of the computer, this isn't a prediction that um, it would be, it would be a massive um, replacement for human work at all levels. And going back to 1890s, when the first computers came out to, to calculate the census, because that, as Talia mentioned, used to be tabulated by hand. Um, and each time it does change the nature of work, and, it, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be impacts that we've alluded to here in terms of changing the way, um, you know, Mark is written or assisted by AI or, or customer services provided through, through end agents. It will certainly change in some ways. But I predict that the the it's not going to be a wholesale replacement for humans in any broad way. Just as you know, Talia alluded to the example of Copilot and people. I've seen, I've read many articles. Well, this is going to put all developers out of business over the next two to three years. That's complete BS. It's no, everyone knows that's not true. Um, but it may allow for more productivity. It may allow for the cycle time on software to speed up. It may allow for uh, on the margin, different skills to be more important in terms of folks coming in learning computer science or um, programming skill sets today. Um, but I think it just makes us more productive. Um, not that it won't have impacts and won't shift the nature of work in some ways. I don't mean to minimize that because that's very real. But I, I think when you look at the whole, you'll see we come out ahead. At least until we reach the singularity, I'm pretty convinced of the need for more and more engineers. And in fact, you could have gone back 10 years ago and been like, ah, oh, there are all these cool like developer tools now that are coming out and making it way easier to integrate things. Or, oh gosh, like there's these, you know, self-serve products like Zapier that totally make it easy for non-technical people to connect products and integrate things. And guess what? Like every year we need way more engineers and there's a shortage. And so 
uh, it's like Javon's paradox applied to this, like the more that AI is available and the cost goes down, the more demand that there is. And I think in a lot of areas, you know, that that paradigm will, will hold true. But as Ethan said, exactly, you know, the exact skills and the way that it looks may shift. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I saw some interesting observations and questions about whether you should tell people that when you are talking to an AI versus a real person, it's such an interesting question and mark of our time, but because it Love kind that. of presumes that we wouldn't tell, we wouldn't be able to tell if we were to talking to a real person or an AI. So it's a it, really good existential question. Or if you're talking to a person that's, that's assisted by an AI, who are you talking to? <laughs> um, Actually, and, and what disclosure do you have to make in that case? I don't have any of the answers to these questions, but they're they're great ones to for us to debate. I find that AI can sometimes generate responses that are so detailed and so good that there's just no way that a human did it anyway. So it's like the reverse of uh, of the Turing test. Yeah. So even even the AI, I think I think those AI tools out there to detect whether something is written or responded by AI was not perfect. So it would be very hard for human to answer those questions as well. Yeah, that's yeah. a definitely interesting dynamic. Um, and the, another questions of uh, about the like safety functionality. I think we also touched on this earlier, but there is a specific question about how important is vertical integration of safety functionality with model provider. For example, uh, how important it is to use OpenAI's moderations API with ChatGPT model output versus mix and match with Jigsaw's perspective API? I guess, for Virgo, you may have some thoughts or experience to share on that. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the, the reference to Jigsaw's perspective API, so I don't know that um, specifically. Um, like, all, all the folks like OpenAI and Anthropic and whoever else are, that are training large language models, the, the, they, they care a lot about making them usable and they care a lot about making them safe and making them aligned and you know avoiding hallucinations and so on and so you know they, they, they're going to continue to to work in these these areas and they're going to continue to make it easier for companies like intercom to sort of deploy those in trustworthy ways and so um i, I i'm not convinced that we need to like vertically integrate that like i don't know that like intercom needs to be in the business of training its own massive scale large language models in order for us to like tackle productization and tackle making them trustworthy enough i i don't think we need to do it i think we're going to see a lot of movement in this space um anyway and uh and, and i also think that this sort of generative ai like it gives a lot of freedom to the user to try and figure out how to deploy the model you know there's this this emerging field of prompt engineering where and, you know, my team is doing a lot of this. They're doing a lot of like editing prompts and trying to figure out, okay, how do I, how do I kind of ask the model what I want in the right way to get it to give me the, the, the result I'm looking for. So that's going to get better, at least for a while. That's going to get more powerful. The models are going to get easier to control. And so um, I, I think we're going to be able to see companies in Intercom's position to generate a lot of value and figure out a lot of applications and, you know, design, we're still learning how to design around, design products around these, this new technology that gives great experiences. I, I think, I think there's so many degrees of freedom for people in our position to use that, um, no, I don't think, I don't think the, the safety or the trustworthy stuff has to be vertically integrated like that. And um, I very much doubt that's how it would play out. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and then there were also questions about, um, intercom building its own model, uh, which I guess this doesn't quite make sense for you guys to build like gen general large language models. But as you mentioned earlier, maybe there will be opportunities to do like a mix of each model works better for your use cases while making an API, something like that. Yeah, I I, I mean, I, I certainly that the scale that these models are trained on at the moment, um, it, you know, it doesn't seem to make economic sense for like, every company that's intercom size to be training their own models. It, it, it feels much better to be, you know, having a single um, point that's training a large general model at the moment. But, you know, th th again, there's a spectrum here. There's a sliding scale here. And, um, you know, we will develop expertise at like designing around them and, you know, knowing what to ask the model for. And then also we're probably going to see emerging functionality around like companies like intercom you know, fine tuning models are like, maybe, maybe we'll end up, you know, 
uh, you know, the, so a lot of these new models are trained with like reinforcement learning with human feedback to train with fine tuning. Probably the cost of doing that will come down over time. We'll be able to customize them more to our specific use cases. Um, look, we'll have to see. I mean, it's, it's a bit like there's always this uh, this tension between, you know, do you do you just piggyback on the general thing? How much how much how much better does the general model get versus how much better does fine tuning and doing specific things get? So, you know, it, we'll, we'll have to see how this this space plays out. But um, I, I think there's going to be a lot of degrees of freedom there uh, for companies to kind of take these models and somehow or other customize them and productize them for their area. I, I definitely wouldn't, um, if anyone was saying, oh, you just, you're never going to be able to customize these, like, no way, all, all this is going to come. And uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's at the early days of productization of this technology, it's going to change a lot. It's going to become a lot easier to product. And we're almost approaching the end of our wonderful conversations, but I guess we can take two more uh, questions. Uh, one is about how enterprise companies adopt and extract the value from ChatGPT. Uh, one thing I found fascinating is you have seen like companies starting to working, like integrating that in their offerings, like what Bain is doing. And then on the other side, I think companies like, especially highly regulated banks were wondering about like the information service and the privacy issues and ban their, um, their employees to play around on like company laptops and stuff. Um, so I'm curious to hear Talia and Ethan's thoughts on this question. And a across our portfolio, a lot of our software companies that and it may not even be in categories like intercom where they're really at the forefront of AI and there's like such obvious ways that they're using AI to kind of lead their industry forward. Um, everyone's thinking like, hey, how is this important for my business? And what are the ways that, you know, I might integrate um, some of these models or the uh, chat GPT APIs into my product? And I think the framework that we talk about is that there are a few that there are things that are also highly repetitive tasks that are often done that are re can be really really great to use an ai to help to automate or to streamline so one example that i'm seeing in my portfolio is that one of our companies um, gets a lot of accounting uh, information from their customers and they need to reconcile and flag if there's an error or something that is off and they've had these rule-based systems in the past but you can apply ai and have much better accuracy um, of that. Another really interesting example is related to the summarization piece as well. Um, you know, a customer has, you know, leaves, a, talks to a, a call center um, agent or, or does a conversation with a, a sales rep. And then suddenly, immediately, you can kind of summarize that conversation and then start to generate and create custom marketing collateral just for that um, person and that individual because that whole script, that whole conversation was summarized and then used to help generate kind of first drafts of new marketing content and new marketing collateral to deliver to that end customer. And I guess one last question for Talia and Ethan. People were asking, what are you guys looking for when to invest in uh, pre-seed startups or just, I guess, startups in general? Uh, that's a great question. There's so many different answers to that. Um, Pre-seed is a little earlier than we usually invest, just to put that disclaimer out. Um, usually we're investing in the later seed or really the series A or series B. Um, but our philosophy is to look for, um, you know, hyper growth models wherever we can find them. And usually the way we break that down is to try to pre-diagnose uh, through road mapping. And Ty has been the one pushing a lot of our thinking around AI and its applications to various different things. Um, and we come up with these roadmaps of different thematic areas that we think are that we think are pretty interesting. And they could be really broad, like cloud computing, or, or you know, the uh, consumerization of healthcare, or narrow, like you know, AI's impl uh, impact on customer service. I mean, we don't have something that narrow, but something like that. Um, so I guess I would encourage folks to look because we do a lot of publishing on our blog and on social media of our of our active theses to look to see if what you're building is aligned to something. Um, and then generally speaking, we're looking for, you know, does this have, um, does this have the sort of impact that'll change the way we work or change the way we do entertainment or something that could be kind of a paradigm shift 
in some business process or consumer need fundamentally. Um, that's kind of what we break it down to. And when, what we've noticed is anytime you have like a broad based change of behavior, the way people are going to do something is going to be fundamentally different. That leads to hyper growth companies and that leads for opportunities for startups to disrupt what, um, you know, how work or play or whatever was done before. And so we try to break it down to that key question of, does this really move the needle for some particular role or type of person? Super helpful. And I guess that's the end of our conversation for having got a chance to try for those who haven't got a chance to try the uh, to look at to try to intercoms new features, I encourage you guys to play with the summarization and a few other uh, features yourself. And if you're interested in the venture space, definitely take a look at the customers website. They in, they publish very in depth reports about the cloud and the SaaS space. Um, so, but this is a great conversation. As everyone said, uh, maybe six months later, we'll look it back and some of the predictions will come true. Maybe some will be totally different. Hope we'll have a, another time to circle back and be able to cover more questions. Thanks again, uh, Talia, Ethan, and Fergal for your time today. Uh, I think the intercom team will share some useful links in the chat and thanks all for your insights. Have, have a good day, bye. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.